So uh, this work is with uh, collaborators, two of whom were graduate students and, and, and two professors. So uh, uh, the, the general machine learning setup for this talk is uh, that uh, is as shown in this uh, cartoon. So this box represents a complex nonlinear input-output relationship with, with a very large number of adjustable parameters. And then we seek to do training, which means that based on many examples of inputs and their corresponding desired outputs, and what's desired depends, of course, on what you're trying to do, what, you, what this task of this, this box is going to be. Uh, what we seek to do is to adjust these adjustable parameters to best fit the desired outputs. And we hope that when we do that, the best fit will be extremely close to uh, the actual thing that, that's desired. And then there are two big questions. The first one is, is, is the training practically feasible given this very large number of parameters uh, that, that have to be determined? And uh, second, if the same kind of uh, inputs, uh, let's see, where are, if the same kind of inputs were uh, <coughs> continued after the training, would the desired outputs be reproduced? In other words, will the thing generalize from the examples to, uh, to, to, to a broader class. So uh, in choosing what flavor of machine learning you're going to put in this box, uh, an important determining factor for the choice is that the, uh, what's in the box is, is that it should allow a yes answer to these two questions. Uh, and there have been a, a number of uh, things that uh, people have come up with that generally yield uh, yes answers a lot. Uh, one of them I, I, is, of course, uh, various flavors of deep learning. But in, in my talk, I'm going to be showing some numerical examples. Uh, and they're all going to be based on reservoir computing, but I, I'm not even going to talk, talk about that because I, I think it really doesn't matter which of these, these good methods we, we use. Everything I should, should say should hold, whether it's uh, done with reservoir computing or, or some deep learning flavor or something else. So. Uh, the, the thing that I'm interested in is machine learning applied to dynamics. Dynamics is the study of dynamical systems. And a dynamical system is a system whose state evolves in time and for which the future evolution of the state depends only on the current state. And, and there's uh, many uh, very broad class of, of systems that, of dynamical systems that, that uh, make them applicable to many things. So an, an, an illustrative machine learning task in dynamics might be the following. Let's say we have some unknown dynamical system over here, and we stick some probes in it and take some measurements. The measurements you could think of as being some function of the state of the system. And uh, we collect those measurements in, in a vector that I've uh, symbolized here by little m of t. And the uh, measurements are evolving because the state of the system is evolving. And uh, so the task is given uh, past state measurements, m of t, from an unknown dynamical system, predict the future of those measurements from the past time series that, that, you, that you have. So that, that, that's, that's the problem that I'm going to be looking at, and at least initially. 
Uh, and so uh, let, let's assume that we've, we've uh, been able to train this box. And let's assume that for a, a given input, m of t, this is the measurement, that the output will be m of t that we, we know, because we have collected these past uh, measurements, uh, will be m of t at, at some uh, small time delta t in the future. And we usually choose delta t to be rather small. And we do this training over this past, uh, th these past measurement uh, time series data that we have. But then when it comes time to predict, we don't know what m of t is. And uh, we certainly don't know that. So uh, what we do is we uh, simply take the output and feed it back in. So let's say we're starting, we, we've, we've done the training. Uh, and then at time t equals 0, we start to do a prediction. So what we do is, well, you, you had m of 0 coming in. That, that may be the last of the training data. And then uh, we go into the future. And m of delta t comes out. It gets fed back in again. So I have m of delta t coming in. And then if this continues, I'll get m of 2 delta t and feed that back in, and then get m of, m of 3 delta t and keep uh, going around in this loop. For later reference, it's important to note that the closed loop prediction system is itself an, a time invariant dynamical system, because it's, it's just evolving all on its own. Uh, another thing I want you to uh, notice that I'm calling this the open loop configuration, and this the closed loop configuration. And I'm pointing that out because I'm going to use that terminology uh, a lot for the, in the rest of the talk. So uh, the outline of, of the talk is, first I'm going to talk about prediction of a spatio-temporally chaotic system. And uh, then I'll get to uh, this third, or rather second, uh, bullet, using machine learning to study the ergodic properties of uh, a chaotic dynamical system. And this will be sort of the, the main thing that I'm interested in, in in this talk. And by ergodic properties, I mean as you keep running this dynamical system, there are various kinds of averages you can take. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so what I mean is long term statistical behavior. Now, this is, this is different than, than prediction. Er, ergodic behavior, in some sense, is different from prediction because, uh, let me go back here. When I train over here, this, this m of the, the thing that I get out is not going to be exactly what it should be. And I'm talking about dynamics that's chaotic. So that when you keep going around this loop, you always have a little bit of error. And because of the chaos, uh, the orbit is going to diverge from the true orbit exponentially. So the, the uh, prediction uh, coming out is going to break down well, pretty, pretty quickly. But the question that I posed here was for long-term dynamics. However, this long-term dynamics prediction is not for the precise state, but for the averages. And what we'll see is that even after predictions break down, the averages uh, will, will, or uh, ergodic properties will still be preserved. And, and that's sort of the, the, the main point. Uh, and 
in this uh, uh, third bullet, we're going to ask why or when is a system able, a machine learning system, able to reproduce ergodic properties? And to answer that question, that's the vice versa part of the, uh, uh, of the title. Uh, to answer that question, we're going to use uh, nonlinear dynamics theory to uh, talk about how, uh, when, how, and why machine learning can uh, obtain these ergodic properties. So uh, to begin with, here is uh, a dynamical system that I'm going to use uh, as my example in, in this talk. It, it's a partial differential equation called the kuramoto shevashinsky equation. It's, a, uh, it, it's an equation with a single scalar dependent variable y, which is a function of a, a single spatial variable x, so it's one dimensional d dynamics, and time, time because this is dynamics. And we're also going to use period periodic boundary conditions on a, a periodicity length L. And this system is, uh, or this partial differential equation, it's a, these subscripts represent partial differentiation with respect to the subscript. So this uh, y, y sub x, 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 x is the fourth derivative, fourth partial derivative of y with respect to x, for example. So uh, a main uh, quantifier of chaos is the so-called uh, maximum Lyapunov exponent, which tells you that if you have two orbits, maybe this is the true one, and then maybe this is one that's, that has a little bit of error, and they start off very close to each other, then the distance between them uh, increases by a factor of e in what I would call a Lyapunov time, and this lambda max is simply the inverse of the, the Lyapunov time. So this is a, a natural uh, quantity to uh, scale time by to, uh, w when you're talking about a, a, a prediction of a dynamical system. So uh, now what are we going to do? We want to do numerical experiments. So we're go what we're going to do is we're going to say that our numerical solutions of the, the uh, kuramoto shevashinsky equation are going to be uh, simulate uh, this, the evolution of, this, uh, of our unknown system. So we're assuming that, we're pretending at least, that we don't know anything about this equation. We're just looking at y, the evolution of y, and then we're taking some simulated measurements from that time evolution of y, and uh, we then, after a while, we stop doing that, and we want to predict the future evolution without knowledge of the equation itself. So, that, that, so that's the uh, idea. So the training data input to the open loop machine learning system, that is the simulated data, is, this, uh, is going to be a vector whose elements are capital Q values of Y at evenly spaced points in the periodicity length. <clears throat> and I'm going to take this, this Q to be, for the, for the sake of having nice pictures, I'm going to take this Q to be uh, fairly large. I don't have to, but for the nice pictures, I'm going to do it. The, so, so that the spatial distance between these, these measurements, namely L over Q, is going to be small enough that the Q discrete measurements yield a, a good approximation to the spatially continuous function Y of X and T. 
OK, so now let's just do what I, I said. Do this close, let's close the loop and, and run the thing and, uh, and, and see what we get. And here's an example with L equals 60. Spa the spatial variable x from 0 to L is plotted vertically. Uh, time is running horizontally. And it's scaled by the maximum Lyapunov exponent. So these numbers, uh, like this number 5 here, represents 5 Lyapunov times, 5 exponentiations of the error. So if an initial error, uh, if you had an initial error over here, uh, based on the Lyapunov exponent, you'd think that the error would be e to the 5, pretty big number. So, and then the, uh, the color coding is the, uh, the value of, of y of t. And the red is, is the largest value, which is around 2 for this equation. And, and the, the deep blue is the smallest value, which is around minus 2 for our run. And uh, then the pale green color, importantly, is around 0. So, on this top panel, I have what I'm calling, quote, the truth, the true state. And that's gotten by actually solving the kuramoto shevershinsky equation by some numerical technique. And the beginning here is at time 0. So what we, this time 0, what, what you can think of it as is the training was done in negative time. And then at time 0, rather, if the, the inputs were uh, and the outputs, the training data was done in negative time. And then the training, when you match the, uh, the adjustable parameters, is done at time t equals 0. And then after that, after 0, the uh, machine learning prediction uh, is produced. So this is the, the evolution of the, the true state the evolution of the machine learning predictor. And uh, this is the error. It's this minus that. And you see that, that we're getting uh, sort of reasonably good prediction out to around five Lyapunov times. And we uh, think of that as, as uh, being uh, pretty good. Uh, Another point to notice here is that this uh, partial, it's a partial differential equation. So the, 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 the state space is infinite dimensional. You know, I, there's an infinite number of initial conditions I, I could put down. But as the orbits evolve in time, they uh, go to uh, a subset in this uh, initial, in the uh, state space, and the subset is called uh, the attractor, and then the orbit moves around chaotically on the attractor. And in this case of L equals 60, the attractor dimension is about 14. And it, the, the attractor is generally a fractal object. Uh, I think the resolution is about six, 64 or something like that. I don't remember how. I think it gets to the attractor pretty quickly. I don't, but I don't remember. Uh, so now this is just a repeat of, uh, of that slide, these pictures. But now com comes the... Uh, thing that we're, we're really interested in in this talk is if I examine these two, two panels, uh, we notice that the dynamics from the Emma machine learning prediction looks kuramoto shevershinsky like even after this prediction is broken down. So my contention is that if you were shown, handed these two panels, and you weren't told which was which, 
you would have, uh, you probably couldn't tell which was the prediction and which was the true evolution. And, uh, and, and, and that's sort of uh, the main uh, thing that I want you to take away from those pictures. So the question is, has the long-term dynamical behavior of the kuromoto shevashinsky system truly been replicated? If it has, even after the sense of dependence implied by chaos causes the prediction to fail, uh, the ergodic statistical properties of the autonomous closed loop reservoir dynamical system that we originally constructed to do these short-term predict predictions should also closely resemble those of the true system. In other words, we designed it with the hope of doing short-term prediction, but it's also telling us something about the long-term dynamics. We hope. So uh, now let's talk about finding ergodic properties of a dynamical system purely from a finite uh, time series data string. That, that, now, this, this problem of finding ergodic behavior from a finite uh, time series data string is, uh, is one that's uh, uh, been for a very long time of uh, very great interest to people in nonlinear dynamics. And the current uh, way or the, the, that most everybody does this is to use uh, so-called embedding techniques. Uh, in particular, delay coordinate-based embedding te techniques have been very intensively used. Generally, they find good results on low-dimensional uh, chaotic systems. Now, in the system we were just looking at, the dimension was, was 14 for the attractor. Uh, that would be considered extremely high-dimensional in this, in this context. So the, the question is, uh, can we exploit the long-term machine learned dynamics to find ergodic properties of high-dimensional dynamical systems? So this is something that in the past has not been possible to do. So uh, this just summarizes the approach, and I'll just read it. Since, since the training determine, determines the adjustable parameters, the trained closed loop uh, machine learning prediction system is a known dynamical system. We know what's in this box. We built the box. So we, we know exactly what's in, in the box. And we, we've now we've, the box has in it a lot of adjustable parameters. But now through the training, we've determined all the adjustable parameters. So we know everything about what's in the box once we've done the, the training. <clears throat> so as for usual mathematically known system, which this box with, tra with the training is, uh, its long-term ergodic properties can be obtained by standard numerical techniques. I could take that, the equations of that box with the training uh, parameters determined, put it on, the, on a computer, and run it for as long as I like and do whatever I want to it to uh, determine whatever I want. So uh, since the uh, long-term closed-loop dynamics mimics the dynamics of the measurements of the original unknown dynamical system, one might hope that the ergodic properties of the closed, this closed-loop prediction system should be the same as those of the unknown uh, system producing the measurements. So 
let's assume that that hope is fulfilled. Well, what could we do with it? Well, one thing is to find uh, the spectrum of Lyapunov exponents of this chaotic system. Uh, before, I was talking about the largest Lyapunov exponent. But actually, if, if the dynamical system has some dimensionality, uh, whatever that dimensionality is, there will be a spectrum of Lyapunov exponents. And the number of Lyapunov exponents in that spectrum will be the dimensionality of the dynamical system. So if you have, say, d uh, coupled first order autonomous ordinary differential equations, you'd wind up with a spectrum of, uh, of, of d Lyapunov exponents. And the Lyapunov exponent that I mentioned at the beginning would be the largest of those numbers the maximum Lyapunov exponent. Another thing you can use this for is finding unstable periodic orbits embedded in a chaotic attractor. That is a, a very useful thing to do if you want to control this unknown dynamical system by giving, uh, giving it a relatively small perturbations, try to make it do what you want it to do. Uh, and, and then these are a bunch of other things, uh, uh, nonlinear filtering. Uh, it might, you could also use it for looking at the statistics of rare intense events, uh, at least potentially, and uh, determining the li links of a network of network nodes just from time series of the nodal states and determining whether uh, a macroscopic order parameter dynamics of a large system of many interconnected dynamical units uh, is obeying low dimensional dynamics. Most of these things that I've listed here uh, have been done to some extent by delay coordinate embedding, but not yet by, by this uh, machine learning approach. So the one that's really been uh, done uh, is this first one. And I'm going to, that's what I'm going to show you. And these are more like a, a to-do to list for, for the future. So uh, let, since I assume that not everybody knows uh, about the spectrum of Lyapunov exponents, I'm going to give, uh, on this one slide, I'm going to give a, a quick uh, introduction and definition of them. So let's say we consider a, a, a dynamical system uh, of uh, dimensionality capital D. So it has that dynamical system has a state vector z uh, where uh, z is a, a vector with capital D components. And then the dynamics, or the dynamical rule, or the dynamical system, evolves z from any initial condition, let's say z of 0, on into the future to get z of, to get a trajectory z of t. d can, can be infinity, as for example in the Kolmogor, in the kuramoto shevashinsky equation. And in that case, the, there will be an infinite countable infinity of, uh, uh, of uh, Lyapunov exponents in the spectrum. Uh, the evolution, so OK, now I have to define these Lyapunov exponents. And for that case, let's say that d is, is finite. So what, what one does, and in this case, I'm showing you the picture in two for a, a two-dimensional dynamical system to get it on the screen here. Uh, so, so what you do is uh, you consider a little ball. Uh, and by little, I mean I'm going I'm to take the radius of this ball to be uh, a differential. Uh, where is it? So I'm going to. 
evolution of an infinitesimal state visual of infinitesimal rate, dr0, there it is. So that's, that's the uh, initial uh, radius. And then uh, I'm going to evolve all the points, z, each, every point on, on this thing represents a, uh, a value of z, but I'm going to evolve all the z's inside the ball forward in time, and then the ball will, uh, because it's differential, it will uh, distort into uh, an ellipsoid with capital D principal radii, and let's call those principal radii d r sub k. So for each, uh, e each one of these dimensions, uh, w we can have a, uh, a d r sub k. And so k runs from 0 on up to d. So this is a, a d-dimensional uh, ellipsoid. And then on average, this is, it, it, it's, shown by uh, Ocelodet's multiplicative ergodic theorem, which we need not go into, just name. Uh, it, it's been shown that, uh, that uh, one can regard this roughly, uh, the, these r sub k's, as increasing uh, or decreasing exponentially in time uh, at, at some rate lambda sub k. So lambda sub k is positive if, uh, if the r sub k is increasing, and it's negative if, it, if it's decreasing. And this constant, lambda sub k, the efolding rate of one of these principal radii is, is, the, uh, Lyapunov exp is a Lyapunov exponent. So uh, Lyapunov exponents are sort of at the heart of many things. Uh, as I showed you before, they determine uh, the natural scale for looking at, uh, at forecasts of chaotic systems. Uh, there are lots of other uses of, of uh, Lyapunov exponents. Uh, I, I think I'll skip that. I'm just using them as, as an example of, a, of an ergodic property. So if I uh, say that, uh, well, that, that, that the, uh, the closed loop system is capturing the true dynamics, then maybe it has the same Lyapunov exponents as this unknown system that produced the data that, uh, that, that the machine learning system was uh, uh, trained on. So plotted here in blue is the uh, closed loop machine learning system Lyapunov exponents. So the Lyapunov exponents plotted vertically here are lambda sub k, and k is the Index, an integer going from 1, 2, 3, uh, is the index of this Lyapunov exponent. And these indices are uh, determined by putting the various numbers in rank order. So lambda 1 is the largest Lyapunov exponent. If lambda 1 is positive, then the, the attractor is chaotic. Lambda 2 is the second largest, lambda 3 is the third largest, and so on. And uh, we can determine these uh, Lyapunov exponents from the, uh, from the machine learning system, because we know the machine learning system. We could put it on a computer, and we can calculate its Lyapunov exponents. Importantly, I want to emphasize that in calculating the Lyapunov exponents, you have to take a derivative, you have to take a differential of the, uh, 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 you, you want to look at evolutions of differentials, so you have to take a, a derivative of, of these equations. And then the red is, uh, again, doing a, 
a computation, but now for the kuramoto shevashinsky equation. And you see that these uh, are, that, 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 that the, the blue is providing a very good approximation uh, to the red. And again, I want to emphasize that the blue is coming purely from this simulated data with no knowledge of the system. Also, I want to emphasize that this is running from 0 to 30, and we've gotten more, more than 20 Lyapunov exponents. So uh, I don't think uh, anything like this has ever been produced by any other method. Uh, usually, it, it stops somewhere around 3 or 4 or something like that, if, if you're lucky. And, and even then, it might introduce some spurious exponents that, that shouldn't be there. So, so this, this, this method uh, of using data to get Lyapunov exponents seems to be doing better than anything that, that has ever been done before. Uh, however, uh, I cheated. This is not what we got. This is what we got. So uh, it looks like the positive exponents are uh, doing well, but once we get to negative, it, it's uh, they're systematically off in a, a bigger way than, than we would like. And what did we do to go from the, the slide before this to this slide? No, what did we do to go from this slide to the slide before this? Uh, what we did is, is the following thing. So here is, here's this. The, the, what I'll call the raw, the raw, raw result, and this is the uh, fudged result. Uh, what we did is, if you look over here, you see these red things are sort of plateauing once you get to zero. And what we did is we simply took out two of these red uh, zero exponents that were occurring in the uh, Lyapunov, expon uh, Lyapunov spectrum that came from solving the, the differential equation. Just take them out, and because these are rank ordered, that just shifts this, uh, the subsequent guys over by uh, two indices, and, and, and that's what, what we get. So we would like now, now you'll say, well, well, maybe there's a reason why you should do that, or maybe you shouldn't do that. Uh, in fact, there is a reason why we should do it. And uh, that's what I want to talk about next. So here is the equation. And this equation has periodic boundary conditions. And it's going to have, just on analytical grounds, Usually, to calculate Lyapunov exponents, there's no way of doing it analytically. Uh, you just have to do it numerically. But in this case, we could say that uh, we know for sure that there, there are three zero Lyapunov exponents of this equation. And that's because there are three uh, continuous symmetries. So one is time translation symmetry. Which means that if y of x and t is a solution of this equation, then y of x and t plus a translation, t0, is also a solution. Similarly, because of the, the homogeneity of the equation and the periodic boundary conditions, there's also a space translation symmetry. And then if you look in more detail at the equation, there's also this other symmetry that I've called uh, Galilean invariance. Namely, if y of x and t is a solution, then something like this 
is also a solution for any uh, value of v that I care to put there. So associated with these three symmetries, uh, there are three zero Lyapunov exponents. So the, uh, the learned closed loop machine learning prediction system, being a time invariant dynamical system, also has the time translation invariance and the associated zero exponent. However, I contend that the uh, learned closed loop machine learning prediction system does not have either the Galilean symmetry or the space translation symmetry. And therefore, these two associated zero exponents are not expected to be reproduced by the machine learning system. And so if we want to compare what comes from the equation and what comes from the machine learning system, we should take those two out. So the next slide, I, I want to show, uh, just, just go through this argument for the case of the, the Galilean symmetry. So uh, at least indicate a flavor of the argument. So associated with the Galilean symmetry, there is a constant of the motion of this kuramoto shevchensky equation, which is just the average value of y. When I used my initial condition to solve the equation, I made the average, average value of y zero. So this constant c was zero in the training data. The Lyapunov exponent spectrum computed uh, directly from the, from the kuramoto shevchensky equation, however, allow, allows for orbit perturbations in all directions including perturbations that take the, or, the orbit off this C equal constant hypersurface. So it gets, this zero, gets this, the zero exponent that, that the equation has that's associated with the Galilean symmetry. But because the training is done on a single orbit of the system, the orbit that you're training on always has the same initial value of c that you started the orbit on. And so the machine learning device can't know anything about what's, what happens when c is changed. And so that's, that's why we, we should not expect it to get that exponent. So uh, now to sort of just see if this reasoning is reasonable, uh, we, uh, we modify the, the, the kuramoto shevchensky equation to break its Galilean and space translation symmetry. Uh, so we still keep the periodic boundary conditions, but we threw in this inhomogeneous term multiplying uh, the second derivative of y with respect to x term, and then we just repeat uh, what we did uh, before. And uh, what we see is this, and now the two spectrums match uh, even better than they did before when I cheated, uh, and there's no, uh, there's no cheating in this one. This is just what came out of both of them. So uh, now, I don't okay. So now the question is, uh, aside from possible corrections for symmetries, and symmetries are sort of un, in practice are sort of unusual anyway. So aside from them, does the short-term closed-loop forecasting machine learning system always successfully replicate the long-term ergodic behavior of the, uh, of the chaotic process? And the answer is no. Successful replication depends on what we call hyperparameters of the learning system. So let me just talk about hyperparameters. So you know this box has a lot of things in it, and 
you make some choices about what you put in the box. And in addition to these, uh, uh, the, these adjustable parameters, there's also typically a few other parameters that we call hyperparameters that specify global properties of the machine learning system. So for example, in reservoir computing, uh, there's the strength of the nonlinearity of the, uh, 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 of the elements in here, the duration of the memory, uh, the regularization parameter that we use for the, the training, and, and other things. And these hyperparameters are often set by the user based empirically on doing some trial and error and picking some parameters that could give good results. You can also do this more systematically, but this is pretty typical. So, I mean, we, we're now using Neldamide to try to optimize over these uh, hyperparameters, but let's not get into that. So uh, let me just now show you this picture. So this is what you saw before. This, this is, uh, so you, you, you see that uh, the, the, the prediction breaks down, but we're still getting something that looks like good ergodic behavior. Now here is another case where we used different hyperparameters. We sort of looked around for hyperparameters that would illustrate and give us a picture like this. Uh, but what you see here is you, you're sort of getting uh, something that's like what the, uh, uh, what the uh, KS equation does, but then it stops. So the long-term behavior here is uh, totally different than over there, just has nothing to do with it. On the other hand, you see that the short-term prediction in this case is uh, basically about as good as it, is in, as it is in that case. But the two are totally different with respect to the long-term ergodic behavior. So uh, now we ask uh, when, how, and why is ergodic behavior replicated, and when, how, and why can the replication fail? So uh, that's discussed in this paper. And I'm going to conclude this talk by outlining some of the considerations in this paper to uh, to, to, to these questions. Uh, and uh, let's see. And the important point is that I'm going to be using the, uh, some ideas from chaotic dynamics and, and dynamical systems to uh, analyze the uh, uh, the operation of the closed loop machine learning system and why this happens or doesn't happen. So uh, let's let uh, A denote the attractor of this unknown dynamical system from which the measurements are being taken. So as I said at the beginning, there's some, you know, imagine there's some initial condition that the unknown system has. After a while, it starts moving around on this uh, set, which is a subset of the, the whole state space. And that's called the attractor. And we're uh, denoting that A. So that's A is the attractor of the unknown system. And then what we, uh, one of the things that we show is that the training can ideally lead to the existence of an invariant dynamical set uh, in the closed loop machine learning configuration where B is the image of A. So what I mean by an invariant, uh, uh, an invariant set, I mean that 
if I look at the, the, if I take a point on that set and I evolve it forward in time, that point will, will stay in the set, never leave the set, and it will keep, uh, I'll, I'll assume also that the point is ergodic, it will keep uh, going around and around in the set and, uh, and fill out and visit every place in the set. And that's true for any point in the set. So uh, this A uh, is uh, having an image uh, B inside the uh, machine learning device. So the machine learning device has some state. And that in that state space, there's this set B that is an image of A, which is to say that if you have any point in A, there's a corresponding point in B. And that correspondence is uh, given by this transformation that I've called uh, G. So uh, to see this, let's first consider the open loop configuration. So here is this unknown dynamical system that has a state vector z, there's some measurement and it's fed into the machine learning system. The machine learning system has a, a state vector r of t and uh, we do some training and then couple our, our thing out. But let's, let's not look at the output coupling yet. So this output depends on the trained parameters. The dynamics of the unknown system is that it's just a dynamical system so that if you have uh, z of t, there's some transformation, capital Z, which basically specifies the dynamical system and you don't know what it is, uh, that transforms it forward in time. And let's say we, we, the capital Z transforms it forward by capital T. And then the measurements, m of t, are each measurement is some function of the state variable little z of, of this state. Then this open loop dynamics is given by this, r at time t plus delta t. Well, that's a function of r at time t and m at time t because there's a, an input and uh, then that determines the next value of r. So the capital Z is unknown here, the capital M is unknown there, the r we fully know because I said we know the, the dynamical system. And then the output depends on the adjustable parameters and we hope to make the output equal to uh, m of t plus delta t. And what I'm going to be assuming is that this hope, this fitting, the training, uh, actually works out to be uh, exact. So this is an ideal case where I'm actually successful replicating as the output exactly what I want. Now, that never happens. But if you want to uh, uh, consider things theoretically, it, it's a nice hypothesis to make because then you, you can proceed a little bit further and, and, and get maybe get some under, understanding that could be useful. So uh, now I want to talk about this concept uh, that people in nonlinear dynamics or dynamical systems called called generalized synchronization, and people in, uh, in reservoir computing call the echo state property. So let's assume that transients in the unknown system have died out, so the orbit is jumping around on, uh, on the attractor A of the uh, state space of the unknown system. For the machine learning prediction to work, we need this. And what, what we need is that 
assuming these transients have decayed, uh, that the machine learning state, R of t, is independent of its initial condition. And thus, R of t is completely de determined only by uh, the measurements. But then the measurements are determined by z. So uh, there, that means that if you know z, there is a, uh, a relationship g to z. So this is like saying that uh, in the open loop configuration, the, uh, the, the, the uh, state r is slaved to uh, the state r is slave to the motion uh, of z. And therefore, it doesn't depend. It's come to that, and it uh, doesn't depend on its initial condition after a while. So in nonlinear dynamics, this is called generalized synchronization, while in the context of reservoir computing, it's been called by Jaeger the, the echo state property. Examples suggest that the generalized synchronization with G invertible and differentiable can be typically attained uh, by adjustment of the hyperparameters. And we're going to assume then that G is invertible and differentiable. The, uh, the differentiable part is necessary for us if we're going to do Lyapunov exponents because we have to take derivatives. And Lyapunov exponents are defined in terms of, of derivatives. So this, this uh, issue of differ differentiability was addressed by me and my coworkers, uh, Hunt and York, about more than 20 years ago in, in this paper. Uh, and, and we need this differentiability. But it's not a hard thing to, uh, to achieve, particularly in, in reservoir computing. One, one can, can think about that, and, and, and it's, it's not that hard to do. So uh, we do that. And now, uh, if, you, if you look at this set B that you created in the, uh, in the open loop configuration, uh, if it's exact in this ideal case, if you then close this loop and everything is exact, there's, there's, then you're just going to be able to predict forever. You'll just get a true orbit. It'll be identical. You know, it's, it's absolutely precisely the same uh, evolution starting with the same initial condition as the uh, original system, then it just stays there forever. But it, it's not exact, so there are little errors. And then it becomes very important whether this, uh, the, this invariant set of the closed loop system is, uh, is stable or not. Now, we designed it to be stable in the open loop case, but once we take away the original system that was driving it and feed this output back to the input, that doesn't change the invariant set B at all, but it can totally change its stability. Because if you make a little change to the output, then it gets fed back in, and it can do something. So the closed loop Lyapunov exponents for orbits on B are, uh, are the same as, as they are on the, uh, on the original system, on the attractor of the original system. Uh, and, and if the original system is chaotic, it will have uh, positive exponents for perturbations that don't push it out of B. Uh, but this B is lying in a, a much higher dimensional space uh, because uh, the dimension of the space of the closed loop system is 
for example, in reservoir computing, it would be the number of reservoir nodes, which might be like in our example, I, we used like 9,000 nodes, and the dimension of this system, of this attractor was 14. So it's much higher dimensional. And so there are a lot more Lyapunov exponents. And if one of them is positive, uh, and is not included in the surface, that is, it, it's for perturbations transverse to the surface, then a little uh, deviation from the surface will grow exponentially. So uh, if one of these additional Lyapunov exponents is positive, then we're going to have a situation like this. When we start doing the prediction, uh, we're starting very close to B, but then we'll stay close to B for a while, but then because we have exponential di divergence, eventually it has the possibility of moving far away. On the other hand, if all these extra exponents are negative, then if we start close to B, uh, we're going to stay close to B, even if we're being jostled around. And the dynamics on B is the same as the dynamics on the original system. So in this case of instability, uh, the uh, closed loop uh, machine learning predictor uh, is going to have replication in the long term that, that fails. Whereas in this stable case, replication in the long term is going to succeed. In our paper, it's shown how to compute these additional Lyapunov exponents. It, one has to do some tricks uh, that are non-trivial, uh, but I won't go into that. And furthermore, that the appearance of, uh, of such a, uh, a transverse positive Lyapunov exponents uh, corresponds to our exper numerical experimental observation of the onset of replication uh, failure. So uh, if thinking of this ep epoch over here where it, you're getting good prediction, and this epoch over here where you're getting uh, terrible uh, replication of long-term failure, you, you can uh, think of that as the, the, the good long-term prediction is this part, and the failure is when it, it rapidly moves off and, and does that. So uh, with this, uh, through the possible presence of this additional positive Lyapunov exponent, we can diagnose and understand the stability uh, of the uh, diagnose and understand the stability of the this invariant set B of the closed loop system and of the success or failure of the long-term re replication. However, it, it's not uh, uh, completely clear how you would use this for designing for uh, stability uh, of B. Uh, it is useful, however. Uh, you know, when we were doing our numerical experiments, we first got this result where it was good. But we wanted to have another, we wanted to design the experiment to give us something like, like this. And we were using reservoir computing. And reservoir computing has these uh, uh, hyperparameters. One is called the spectral radius, which sort of makes things more, if you increase it, it makes things more unstable. And uh, so we thought that maybe we could get something like this, which would make a nice slide for a talk like this uh, by increasing the spectral radius and uh, 
that's what we did, and, and, and it worked. So the reason we did that is because we had this, this understanding over here. So it, you know, having the understanding allowed us to go from here to there, and likewise, it would have had the, the effect of allowing us to go from here to there if, if we had started over here and wanted to get over there. So it, this is useful information, and it certainly uh, you're not going to get anywhere in, in designing if you don't have this as a basis. So to conclude, uh, machine learning offers exciting opportunities for using data to analyze and explore chaotic dynamical systems. And conversely, we've also discussed the use of concepts from nonlinear dynamics to understand when, how, and why machine learning can accomplish uh, replication of ergodic behavior. Thanks very much. <laughs>